Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's session of Turn on Federalism. We are very pleased to welcome you to the session on COVID-19 and Indian federalism. Please allow me to make some introductory remarks before I hand over to our distinguished speaker today. This event is organized by the Hans Seidel Foundation and Fifty Shades of Federalism. The Hans Seidel Foundation is a political foundation entrusted with a mandate from the German parliament. Its core task is to promote democracy and the rule of law within Germany, um, but also worldwide with over 100 projects in 60 partner countries. Fifty Shades of Federalism is a project established in 2017 at Canterbury Christchurch University in the UK. It publishes regularly short briefing papers on different dimensions of federalism. The new online series Turn on Federalism is a cooperation between our two organizers. The aim is to lift the debate on federalism to a global level. We hope to engage experts, politicians, civil society activists around the world in order to discuss the possibilities of federalism, the different shades and country by country evaluations. Our topic today engages what would have been the dominant uh, topic of 2020. The COVID-19 crisis and the related coronavirus has seen countries in the world go into lockdowns. It has seen major economies crumble. It has seen um, government interventions politically, economically and financially at a level never seen before. It has also been a particular challenge for federal countries where questions about who is responsible for what, when and how have become very prominent. We will discuss this interaction uh, today in the case of India. Please allow me to introduce today's speaker. Uh, today's speaker is Professor Vishwa Alok. He is an associate professor at the Indian Institute for Public Administration in New Delhi and a member of the 15th Delhi Finance Commission. Those of you who have joined us before will know our moderator for today's event uh, is the wonderful Anja Richter, who is the resident representative of the Hans Seidel Foundation in the United Kingdom. Before I hand over to Alok, please allow me to talk you once again through the rules for today. If you want to listen to any other language than English, please click on the interpretation button in your Zoom uh, dashboard and choose the language you want to listen to. We have translation in French, Spanish, and in Myanmar language. Please use the Q&A box to pose any questions. We will make sure to pass these questions on to, to Professor Alok so he can uh, uh, answer them in the Q&A session of this part. Thank you very much for joining us. I hope you are as much looking forward to today's session as I am. Um, with that, I'm very, very pleased to hand over to Alok for today's presentation. Thank you. Alok, you are on mute. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. And uh, good, good evening to friends here in India and in Myanmar and other parts of Asia. Good afternoon to friends there in Europe, particularly in Germany, France, and UK, in North America and Latin America. 
I'm uh, indeed grateful to Ansidal Foundations and 50 Shades of Federalism that Shoran and his team is bringing out. And uh, I'm sitting here at the Institute of Public Administration and grateful to the director, Sutra Party, for his encouragement. I have uh, written a paper to, to 50 Shades of Federalism some time back, somewhere in April, which was published there. And Soren has asked me to make a presentation on this. So I'm indeed very, very grateful to him. Before I, I it's actually 10 slides before I can take up a few questions here. And this is all about the structure here in the Indian Federations and the kind of challenge that we have uh, just uh, facing after this pandemic. As you can see from the slides, the Indian uh, Federation, it comprises a union government, 28 states. Out of these 28 states, 10 of them are considered special category states. It has considerable international borders. The, the states which is sharing its boundaries with Myanmar, they are also considered as special category states. Uh, they get a special fiscal dispensation from the union government and uh, even the finance commissions or the Niti Ayo. We do have union territories. They are governed directly from the union governments and three of them are with legislatures. This includes Jammu and Kashmir, NCT of Delhi and Puducherry. Down the line, we have about 2.5 million rural local governments, what we call it a panchayat raj institutions. They are again at the three rungs, what we call it a district panchayat, block panchayat and village panchayats. About 4 million elected representatives. So we do have so many governments here in Delhi, uh, here in India. Likewise, we have uh, municipal bodies or what we call it a municipalities. In the urban areas, about 4.5 thousands, and they are at three levels, municipal corporations for big cities, municipalities for not so big cities, and nagar panchayats in the transitional areas from the rural to urban. As you can see from the slides, uh, India, it has a population of about 1.34 billion is uh, going to be 1.38 billion now uh, as per some estimates because uh, the census is going to be there in 2021 and the area is about one third of US and China. It's quite, quite dense, pop, you know, it's about one third of the most densely populated city in the uh, country that is what we call it Bangladesh. India has about 22 official languages. One can take a civil service examinations even the Nepali language and about uh, 1,600 odd mother tongues. 200 religions, there are backward caste and backward uh, scheduled tribes. Scheduled means it is there in the constitutions for the affirmative actions. The income distribution is quite skewed. The per capita income of Goa is about nine times that the poor states, what we call it, uh, Bihar or Jharkhand. And the choices of the people, it varies from one state to another. If you, let's say, tax uh, on alcohol, or if you increase the rate of taxation on alcohol in the state of Goa, there will be a lot of hue and cry. But in the adjoining state, that is Gujarat, there's a complete prohibitions. So, People choices, it varies from one state to another. People do drink or eat uh, mustard oil in the Northern India. They drink or they eat uh, uh, coconut oil in the Southern part of India. So if you are a true Indians, you must have the taste of both the mustard oil as well as the, 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 the coconut oil. The constitution here in India, 
In India, the Article One of the uh, of the Constitution it says, "We, the people, is uh, that is India shall be a union of states." It doesn't really say it's a federation of states, but there is a seven scheduled Indian constitutions. It has three list: what we call it a union list, a state list, and a concurrent list. Union list, it contains about uh, 100 functions, including the functions on the interstate migrations. And a state list, it has about 66 functions, which includes public health, public order, and local governments. That's a different case that public health is also the functions of the local governments. The local government draws its powers from the state governments. Then we have a concurrent list functions, which includes the functions related to social securities, preventions of contagious diseases. In fact, the Disaster Management Act has been created out of this social securities and uh, social insurance. When this pandemic, uh, it arrived here in India on the 30th of January, uh, it was there in Kerala, some students came from Wuhan at uh, so they brought this uh, uh, COVID-19 here in India. As of now, it's about 10 million patients. It's a cumulative numbers that I'm uh, showing it here. It's keep on increasing. It's only second to US. Uh, and uh, it's about 7,000 in a million, so which is not a very big number. The deaths are about uh, 281 thousands, which is not a very big figure. Uh, the, the international figure is, uh, uh, is, is little more than this. The first uh, national lockdown, it was imposed sometime uh, in March, the last uh, week of March uh, that was announced by the prime ministers. So this lockdown was there for about a month or two or so. All the states accepted this and the people were actually there in the house arrest. The objective of the lockdown, the primary objective was to contain the coronavirus, but the hidden objective there was to develop the infrastructure. As you know, the public health here in India is not so good. It's, it's about 1% of the national income is spent on public health and the expert says that this need to be increased to 2.5% or so. There were not enough uh, sanitizers, masks, ventilators, and the hospital beds uh, in, the, in the month of March. And as of now, India is producing about uh, half a million PP kits and 0.3 uh, million masks and uh, on a daily basis. So they're actually exporting it uh, to other countries. We are also exporting uh, hydrochloroquines and a uh, couple of other things. So, so we have improved quite a lot so far as this pandemic is concerned. There's a interstate variation so far as the public health provisions are concerned. We do feel that Kerala, which is a small state in the southern part of India, they do have a good provision so far the public health is concerned, but some other states, for example, West Bengal or Jharkhand and others, public health provisions are not that good. So these are the three acts which have been used to respond to COVID-19. The first and the foremost, which is the so important is Disaster Management Act. As I said, this was created uh, you know, the provision there in the concurrent list uh, to be very precise item 23, which is about social securities. So the government of India and the state government, it, uh, they, they invoke some certain provisions of the disaster management. There's an epidemic act, which is about uh, 120 years old act of the British era. Uh, this was actually created after this Bombay disaster that took place. So that was used only for the health purposes and just to give support to 
to the health workers, particularly the doctors and nurses and others. The people, those who are violating lockdowns, so the various provisions of the Indian Penal Courts, 1860, this was used there. So this slide says, what are the output loss of uh, this uh, uh, COVID-19 pandemic? During the lockdown, we lost so much of output. There was a large scale unemployment. In fact, uh, uh, the unemployment, uh, many people lost their job, even in the organized sectors and uh, Many workers, those who were there in the cities for uh, employments, they went back to their respective places. So the tune of about 9.7 million. The high growth Indian economy actually contracted. So it contracted uh, to the extent 23.9, during April to June, that is the period, uh, quarter two, that uh, the fiscal year, it contracted just about 7.5%. Experts do believe in the third quarter, perhaps we will get a positive uh, growth there in the economy. The public finance is there in stress. From 72% public debt, it has gone to 85% or so and uh, the fiscal deficit is going up. The GST collections is going down. It's, it's very obvious because uh, in the case of no output and no productions or, and, the, and the trade, the GST is going down. There's a certain sector totally collapse as it's happening in, uh, in other parts of the world, particularly tourism industry or the hospitality industry. It also reduced consumer activities quite a lot. We do have a figure if someone uh, is interested to know about that. So the government of India, it announced certain packages and the prime minister is announced a package said this is going to be 10% of the national income. And this uh, money was released in, in five installments some of these sectors, as you can see from the slides, uh, they are the primary sectors, which are unable to function in the, in the absence of uh, good uh, support from the government, particularly the small and medium enterprises, the poor migrants and uh, farmers, they were also given a package, agriculture, fisheries and food processing sectors, in fact, the agriculture is still showing a positive growth rate. As you can see, these eight sectors, which was affected quite a lot. So they were also given uh, a package from the government of India side. The Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme, what we call it a Mahatma Gandhi Rural uh, Employment Guarantee Schemes. This allocation has been increased quite a lot in this particular scheme. And the money was spent on health and education. There was uh, some schemes like free food grains and direct cash transfers to the poor people. Uh, the central bank, what we call it, the Reserve Bank of India, they provided the facilities uh, for uh, the small and medium enterprises. And uh, they have also given uh, uh, concessional loans to states and extended the periods of overdrafts from 14 to 21 days and from 35 to uh, about 50 days or so. There were some measures that has been taken by the state governments. They enhanced their health expenditure, social assistance to vulnerable uh, announced in many of the states free rations in addition to what the government of India announced. And they also announced assistance to laborers, construction workers, and daily wage workers. And special announcements to retain migrant laborers because uh, many of the state government, particularly Uttar Pradesh, 
West Bengal and Bihar, they wanted to retain its own labors. So they announced a couple of things so that this labor do not really migrate from their own state to other states. Some local labor task forces uh, were initiated in many states. The prominent among them are Kerala, Odisha, and Rajasthan. In fact, there in Odisha, the, the head of the village panchayat, this is the lowest level, they have been empowered to the extent that uh, the district magistrate, the kind of power that has been assigned to district magistrate was assigned to him. Kerala is of course known for his local governments. So they use uh, the power of the local government extensively to contain this pandemic. This is the last slides. Uh, some of uh, the suggestions, it's not my suggestions. Many people are making these kind of suggestions. In fact, the constitution of India is quite silent about uh, environment, it's also silent about disaster management. So this could be the first obvious suge suggestions. The item in the constitution and particularly in the concurrent list. So both the union government as well as the state government can take some measures out of this. Health about 1% to 2.5%. There is a need to make an amendment in the Disaster Management Act 2005. So the role of the local government need to be very clearly pronounced. As of now, there is a role of the union government, there is a role of the state government and role of the district governments. Local authorities, they draw their powers from the district government. And my suggestion here is that this provision of the Disaster Management Act need to be consistent to Article 243ZD, which talks about the district planning committees, which, which has a role of both panchayat and municipalities, which means the rural local governments and the urban local governments. The provisions related to human migration, civil supplies, and food support that need to be strengthened in the Disaster Management Act. And uh, autonomy need to be given to the states so that they can make their own assessment and take some measures. The definition of an epidemic disease, which was uh, mentioned there in the epidemic, uh, you know, the 1897 act, that need to be very clearly defined so that emergency provisions can be invoked. So uh, these are the, uh, my initial presentations and I'm very happy to take a few questions on this. So over to you, Anya. Well, thank you very much, Professor Alok. I'll let you close your slides, thank you. And to our global audience, I'd also like to quickly take this opportunity to extend my personal welcome on behalf of the Hans Seidel Foundation. And it's my great pleasure to now moderate this part of the event where you get to ask your questions on Alex's presentation, but also on issues that relate or apply to your respective countries as well. I will take the liberty and start with a few questions just to get us going, but I can already see the questions are flowing in. Of course, this is your chance to ask your questions. And as Søren explained, please use the Q&A box to pose any questions you have. I would kindly ask you to keep them brief so I can quickly read them all and get through as many as I can. So just to start us off, um, Alec, you started your paper for the Fifty Shades project saying that COVID-19 has brought new vigor to federalism and devolved government in India. And that is certainly true in many countries. And of course, there's a reason we've included this topic in our federalism seminar series. So far, would you say this new vigor to, to federalism has been positive for federalism in India? And has it actually changed the perception in India of the federalist systems? 
are more are people now more aware of the advantages and disadvantages or the, the pitfalls of the system? Because we already have a question coming in on whether more generally COVID-19 has strengthened federalist structures or rather weakened them. So with that, um, I'll give you time to <laughs> answer some of these questions. These questions. Uh, when this prime minister is took over, uh, Mr. Narendra Modi in 2014, he started talking about cooperative federalism. I understand the term is used there in, in Germany and it's about 100 years ago there in the US. What the prime minister at that time, he wanted to actually say that that's a union government need to cooperate more with the state government. Now, this was a time, this was a test that uh, he made the announcement using the power of the Disaster Management Act, which gives him the power to announce uh, something like lockdown. There is an emergency provision in the Indian constitutions, that is Article 252, uh, which was invoked by Mrs. Gandhi in the 70s, as I've written there in the paper. And uh, many people say that this was misuse because the term internal disturbances was there in that article. This particular word has been deleted. So uh, after Mrs. Gandhi, you know, uh, the subsequent government, they deleted that particular term, there's an article 252. But there is still uh, emergency provisions there in the constitution, which I would say, which has been borrowed from the German constitution when we actually frame the Indian constitution. So when the prime minister announced the lockdown, of course, after the consultation with the chief minister, everybody agreed. It was not like many other federal countries, but the federal government is announcing few measures, the state government is saying no to that. So this was a, a case where all state governments and the union government, they were on the same boat. And uh, it shows that Indian federalism, it has a positive features. Though in many of the state government, there are some political parties, which is, which is there in oppositions uh, of the, uh, there in the central government or the ruling parties. Yes, my response is, it's a positive feature still. Yeah. Thank you. And since you've already mentioned uh, the, the announcement of uh, Prime Minister Modi's lockdown to everyone, we have a related question, whether the union government of India was hurried in announcing the lockdown or, and delayed or probably or delayed in admitting uh, the community transmission in India. Yes, that many people say that the Indian government they delayed the lockdown. And uh, they say the Prime Minister Modi was uh, uh, busy in some other things. But uh, uh, I can't actually say anything on this. Uh, that uh, I do feel personally that this was delayed by, by about two weeks or so. That's right. Mm -hmm. And you said the Disaster Management Act stipulates extraordinary powers to the union government, given that normally the powers for lockdown, the police, public health, closing shops, bars, restaurants, everything we've seen in most countries happening uh, during this pandemic is normally a state competency in India. So do you think the Disaster Management Act is appropriately phrased in giving the union government those powers? Or do you think the central or union government has abused its powers using the Disaster Management Act? Is it a bit of a power grab? Uh, Indian government or the government of India, they use the Disaster Management Act right at the beginning and all state government actually agreed to the union government propositions. Whenever the prime minister announced a next lock lockdown or extended the period, it, they just had a meeting, a consultations with all chief minister of states. After the consultation, they announced uh, these measures. But as of now, 
all state government they are empowered to take decisions on their in their own spheres the list which is there uh, the second list what we call it a state list about public health about entertainments about transportations so all state government they are taking their own decisions it was only there in the initial stages you know that the government of india was taking a decision which was rightly so uh, because uh, like what happened there in brazil uh, the the federal government is announcing something and the state government is announcing something else so that created a chaos but the consultative uh, machinery here in the government of india was quite good and uh, there was some one or two very negligible that kind of cases there when the state government they shows uh, that uh, but which is there in democracy but uh, uh, many of the items or many of the subject which is there in the state list states are still uh, taking their own decisions on that Mm. And and just staying on the Disaster Management Act, it it sounds quite specific in its provisions, as you you've described us as well, with the requirement of a state management authority and a committee or a disaster management plan, including on on the district level. But you've you've also previously said that there's been a reluctance on the lower levels of government to actually implement. Those plans and make district planning committees operational. Apart from the local task forces you've mentioned in your presentations, why do you think others have been more forthcoming, and others more reluctant, holding back in, in implementing those plans? Uh, very good question, uh, Anya. In fact, uh, the local authorities, or what we call it. Uh, Uh, the panchayats or the municipalities, panchayats in the rural areas, the municipalities in the urban areas, they are elected governments, and this was created only in 1993. So the Indian Constitution it identified two tier governments structure, and this was superimposed on this two or two tier structure there. So it is still finding its ways, you know. to be a part of the the fiscal architecture here 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 in india so if any acts that has been created and many people do feel that the local government they lack capacities okay so they will not be able to functions whereas the district government is not really a government the district is a unit uh, where a uh, a civil servants those who are from the all india service they are heading the districts so that they generally get this command from the state government so the state government the chief minister or the chief secretary feels that more confident on the district administrations down the line is only at the block levels so whenever any act and particularly the act like disaster management uh the the bureaucracy or 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 the politicians they do feel that uh, uh, let there be a role of the district government not so much of a role of a local authorities but i particularly feel in the disaster management not so much of this pandemic but for any other disaster for that matter the local government should be assigned certain responsibilities so that they will be able to attend that disaster in the golden hours okay if there is any trek any train accident then the local authorities some of the volunteers of the local authority they will be able to reach there instead of you know attending the disaster from the centralized forces let the capacity be built at the local level so they they are able to actually attend that kind of disaster in the in the golden hours so that's a uh, uh my 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 uh, uh, proposition here and uh, in the exit plan particularly when you go to have a vaccine it's the local government is actually best place to sensitize their own residents about their habits about vaccinations about various other things including physical distancing and all so i think local government do have a role in fact the prime minister uh, there uh, in 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 uh, 
uh, in his address there in April, he said very, very extensively, let's we have to be very vocal on local. So that's a slogan which became very famous later on. So you are, of course, a strong proponent of uh, a bigger role of local and municipal leaders and local government. But doesn't that also mean when you say they mostly lack capacity and funds that, first of all, more money needs to be spent on local government? How do you see the chances for that to change or for the union government to agree to this? Uh, yes, uh, that is there. Local governments, particularly the rural local government, they just generate about 5% of their total resource requirements. That is the case of some of these small municipalities in the urban areas. The exceptional cases are uh, of the municipal corporation, the big cities, for example, the Mumbai or, or Pune, uh, their budget is very big. So the local government, it depends upon the state government. So also it depends upon the union government. The state government, they transfer resources from their state kitty and they also depend quite a lot on the union governments. The finance commissions, which is constituted every fifth year, that's a union finance commission. There is a clause that has been inserted 25 years ago. It says the finance commission has to suggest measures for local governments and enhancing the consolidated fund of the states. So for the last about 25 years or so, each finance commission, they have been making allocations to local government, both panchayat and municipalities. The 15 finance commission, which is the latest one, it has just submitted its report uh, in the month of uh, November and is going to be public uh, next month when the parliament is there. But before that, 13 finance commission, they have made allocations, 2.5% of the union taxes to both panchayat and municipalities. The 14 finance commission, they made some lump sum, uh, what we call it up, uh, uh, numbers, uh, what we call it up, uh, 2,000, um, you know, 200, uh, 2,000 million uh, rupees over a period of five years or so. And uh, both panchayat and municipalities, they got a share out of this. So the 15 finance commission that's going to announce this, we do believe they're going to announce this kind of, uh, uh, this kind of allocations and uh, panchayat and municipalities, the kind of taxes that they levy, both property tax or, a, or an entertainment tax, hardly they collect anything out of this. So they depend on the states and the union governments uh, for this. Yes. But apart from the question of adequate resources, could you elaborate with a few more concrete examples that constrain state and local governments from carrying out an effective pandemic response? I think with, with the focus on, on local government while we stay on this topic. The local governments, uh, actually, it's difficult for the local government to actually tax on their own residents because no elected representatives of the local government would like to be so unpopular that they're taxing their own, you know, uh, the colleagues right there. So they do feel that let the state government levy the taxes and through the intergovernmental fiscal transfer mechanisms, the money must reach them. If the local government is able to spend that money to me, it's an autonomy. Many people, many economists say that uh, if they are able to collect its own resources, that decides the autonomy. But if the, if the capacity is not there, you know, I have visited many local governments uh, all over India. It's just about five, three, four people, that those who are there. And they have many things to do. So, so the property tax is actually a mainstay of the local government, both the panchayat and municipalities. And some service charges, 
piggyback on this uh, property tax. So property tax, entertainment tax, and advertisement tax, these are the few taxes that the local government have. And as I said, on an average, about 5% of the total resource requirement uh, it actually fulfilled. So local governments get money, they get grants from the state government. They also get, they also have some roles in the verticals programs, what the union government announced or the state government announced. As I said about employment guarantee schemes, there are programs related to healthcare, the programs related to primary education. Local government do have a say in the decisions of those programs. And as a related question from the audience, what are the initiatives to revive especially local economies? So not just local government raising taxes, but how can you make sure local economies in India um, will thrive again in the next years to come? That's right. That's a that's a big uh, 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 you know it's a big question that how you revive the local economy here in India. As I said. There is an announcement for both agriculture and agro-based industries. There are some announcements for, for the artisans uh, that some of the arts that the India is, is, is which originated there in India that need to be nurtured, that need to be strengthened further. So there are some announcements, particularly from the central government sites, and more are there in pipelines so that these local industry, the local trades, and these local agro-based industries that, that can be strengthened further. As you've uh, said in your presentation, and I think we've all seen those images of Indian migrant workers traversing the country. Um, there's a question on whether the reverse migration will hurt the Indian economy in the coming years? The reverse migration, it took place and there was a lot of some lessons we have learned because there were some mindless urbanizations. People were coming from all parts of India uh, in search of jobs and they in a, in a living in a, in, a, in a very difficult situations now the government of India and the state governments, they have taken some measures and uh, constructing some houses for these migrant laborers and uh, some social securities need to be provided to them so that if anything happens, they can't be so panicky and goes back on foot or on bicycles. So I think uh, it's a big lesson that we have learned out of this. Um, you've also suggested that health spending needs to increase significantly, but there's a question on how this can be achieved in light of the economic contraction. Where would the money come from, basically? Well, there are uh, there are various ways. Uh, I understand that part of it. Uh, that's a, that's about public expenditure. So. This only, only thing is how you're going to switch your public expenditure. The public expenditure here is about 20% of the GDP. And uh, the kind of taxes that has been collected is, uh, as you have all, all heard about it, most uh, of these uh, taxes are either evaded or uh, avoided. So Indian tax system, we just collect about 20% of the total tax base. So you need to tighten your tax administration machineries. There could be some co uh, corporate social responsibilities. Okay, So there are ways by which you can mobilize resources public, for, for public health, not just through a public expenditure from the government side, but there could be various other things by which you can mobilize these resources from the private sector as well. But there's also a question, of course, is it just about spending more on health? Um, 
how do you also ensure it's more equitable? You've explained how different public health systems are in India, and it really depends on, on, on where you live in India, how you get your health system is. So how can you make sure that, you know, bigger spending or what percentage of GDP also translates to a more equitable system and making sure that different regions or states as well as different parts of the population benefit from it? Yes, one thing is that you are spending uh, on public health. And second thing is that you uh, keep the house in order, you know, keep your own house in order. It's a, it's a management tactics, could be an administration tactics. Once the healthcare system is there on the priority list, then everything could be could be uh, you know in place. So, for example, there in Kerala, your public health system is so good because they did not really allow the private sector to come in. Okay, when the private sector comes in in the public health system, they did not really allow this uh, the, the the government sector to come to come up. So, so so this Kerala is is, is functioning pretty well. And we can, the rest of the state, they can learn from Kerala and tighten up this particular sector still. So it's not that difficult. Only thing is the whole nation has to go toward the directions. Of course, the, the question about money or when it comes to money, it always gets very difficult. And in many countries, we've seen the haggling between the state or regional governments in the UK, also the mayors, arguing with the federal government over who pays for it all. How has this relationship between the union government and the states um, played out in India? No, state government actually it depend quite a lot on the union government. Before the GST was implemented, there was a tax called sales tax. The most important item of the sales tax was the hydrocarbon, which is uh, of the government of India mechanisms, uh, the state government was able to collect the uh, sales tax out of this. And sales tax used to be about 60% of the total tax revenue of the states. So if any big, you know, any demand comes in, then the state government have to rely on the central government grant. But that is not the case of all the states. There are some rich states, for example, Gujarat, Maharashtra, Goa, couple of others. So they can generate resources from their own. They do have business actors uh, in, their own, uh, in their own states. They do have a lot of foreign direct investments. The, the Bombay is a business capital. But there are some other states that depend quite a lot on the union governments so far as the grants and other things are concerned. So would you say this dependence of state governments on the union government is, is healthy? We have a question about federalism in India more, more in general. Under the present situation of one nation agenda, Indian federalism is shaking. So what are your suggestions to safeguard this federal structure? No, I would say this, this depend, dependency is actually a glue, okay, that keeps the entire federation together. And this was by design. It is not by default, it was by design of the Indian constitutions that let all the state they generate its resources, the union government generate more resources and through the intergovernmental fiscal transfer mechanisms, you make the vertical distributions, you also make the horizontal distribution of the resources. So not just the case here in India, it is also the case there in Canada or in, in Australia, where you, where you do have the vertical imbalances and through the intergovernmental fiscal transfer mechanisms, you try and equalize this. So I think it's a good thing uh, and Indian uh, federalism, it was not from below, it was from the top. So we do have a unitary features 
in our constitutions and the union government through the institution like finance commissions to other institutions, they try and equalize this uh, through the intergovernmental fiscal transfer mechanisms. Mm -hmm. um, we have a more general questions on what to do about the job losses. What has the Indian government's response been concerning the loss of jobs during the spike of COVID-19? I think uh, they have made a few announcements uh, uh, so far as the jobs are concerned. And uh, uh, they're quite concerned about, uh, there is uh, some ministry that has been created, fiscal development. There are a couple of other measures that uh, the government of India has taken. The state governments are particularly taking a few measures on this. Uh, Yes, it's a big, big agenda uh, before the government of India and the state governments to, to provide jobs to uh, some of the people, those who lost the jobs. Uh, it's, a, it's a big concern for all of us. Yes. Hmm. And then a more specific question. How about the role of local languages? And you've previously mentioned how many there are. What about the role of local languages in regards to informing local people in India about the pandemic? Also, you've spoken to, to extra programs, the vaccine. How do you make sure everyone is well aware? And I mean, in, in, in many other countries where we only have one or maybe two languages, we, we deal with fake news and disinformation. So the challenge in India with so many local languages is even greater. How do you make sure um, people are well informed about what's going on, but also moving forward, for example, with the vaccine, what's, what they should prepare for? Local language media is very strong, Anya, in India. We have plenty of uh, newspapers, you know, the local televisions, those who are there and uh, and in fact there are quite quite a lot on, on local languages they influence people's mind and uh, they are doing a good job i don't think that's a problem uh, we do not really see that as a problem here in india and most people are illiterate uh, so far as even for the illiterate people there are announcements on radios, on, on televisions, on other places. So we do not really see it's a problem here in India. Despite several languages, despite several dialects. No issue. Yeah. yeah. And I, many I, people, yeah. yeah. Go, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> That's okay. Uh, but many people do, do, uh, do understand Hindi. Many people do understand Bengali and a couple of others regional languages so they must be they, they 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 are speaking their own dialects but they understand many other languages so and on an average indian they at least know two languages um going back to something you mentioned in your presentation about the use of emergency powers um which has been contentious in many countries, especially democratic ones. And you've explained why the emergency provisions of the Indian constitutions could not be used and that the several that the central government, excuse me, and the states have the statutory basis to deal with a pandemic, even like COVID-19. Do you think this might change in the future as a lesson learned and, and prepare for future pandemics? Do you think that the role of the central government or the use of emergency powers, that the list for, for the use of the use of emergency powers could be changed? Anya, as I said, the emergency power there in the constitution, which was article 252, I uh, mentioned that it was abuse and many people do not really believe that by you know invoking article 352 the prime minister of the country became uh, you know it becomes it becomes a dictator uh, in a way 
and uh, they can impose a ban on media, they can impose a ban on various other democratic practices. So this became so unpopular in the 70s that no prime minister would like to use that kind of powers. If the powers are there in one of the act, why go for an extraordinary things like the emergency provisions contained in Article 352 or in some other? So I think they manage it quite well by using these three acts. Uh, and uh, they, they were able to do what they actually wanted to do by invoking the provision there in Disaster Management Act and the places. Okay, well, we've just got a few minutes left, but turning to the issue of health being a devolved matter in, in, in many countries, um, meaning that it rests with the state or the regional level in a federal system. And you've said India has so many governments um, and had interstate variations by providing public health and fighting COVID-19. Do you think states and constituent territories are actually equipped enough to deal with a global pandemic that requires not only the cooperation between the state and federal level, which not just in India, but in many other federal countries we've seen is difficult enough, but also require international cooperation. And also given the magnitude and, and the vast resources of the fight of this pandemic has required, not just financially, but in many countries, the deployment of the military. Do you think this should still be down to state governments to deal with that? Or should there be an increased role for the central government? And I think somebody has commented as well in, in, this, in the box that in India, states do not actually have much power to deal with this. So the way forward can only be the central government playing the biggest role. You know, I, I, I totally agree with you that in a, in a federation, the state government, the kind of subject that has been assigned to them, they must have enough powers to deal with the international agencies. Uh, for example, in the negotiations of WTO or various other things, I think the state government should be there on board to uh, for those kind of negotiations. But uh, on an external matters, I think in most federations, it is the role of the federal government to negotiate with the international agencies. Uh, in a federal system, there is also a need for certain kind of harmonizations. So, I think in this process, in this, uh, you know, uh, when this, uh, in this pandemic, many state government, they come to some kind of a, uh, you know, some kind of an agreement that uh, let the Ministry of Health uh, of the union government, they negotiate with the uh, rest of the governments or rest of the uh, rest of the world so far as the vaccination, so far as various other things are concerned. And they can give few choices to the state government and they can choose out of that, you know. They could give maybe five or six choices to, to the state government. And there would be a lot of consultation processes, you know. We do our Team India. There was a National Development Council uh, in, the, in the past, which has been substituted to Team India and all chief ministers, they are members and the prime minister is the chairperson. So the consultation do take place and most of the differences are run out in those kind of consultations. We can't just say that uh, the central government or the union government is taking its own decisions and the state government is only falling in line. I don't think that is, not the, that, that is the case here in India. There's a lot of consultation that takes place. So, of course, the central government, they do have the capacity to negotiate with the international agencies and they are negotiating with them and they can provide few choices to the states and the states can provide few choices to the, the local authorities so far as uh, the vaccinations and other things are concerned. Yeah. We are nearly out of time. So as my last question, 
I'm gonna, gonna ask you what I've asked all previous speakers, especially given you said federalism, had, it's been a positive experience for federalism during the COVID-19 pandemic. What is the main lesson other countries can learn from India, especially in the context of a, of a federalist system uh, from this pandemic? You know, some lessons that many other countries they can learn from India, that India, they were, they were quite quick to develop the requisite infrastructure, you know, and many countries, they can also learn about the Indian type of therapies so far as this pandemic is concerned. Many Indians are learning that our own lifestyle was much better. And if you go back to your own lifestyle that you can deal with this kind of pandemic. Uh, so, so within India, there are some naturopaths, there are some Ayurved, uh, Vedic uh, you know, practitioners, and uh, many people are relying on them and taking their medicine instead of taking the medicines uh, you know, prescribed by some of these international agencies of the WHO and others. So Indian lifestyle is one. The India's quick response uh, so far as the PP kits and other things are concerned, they are the small scale industries. That is another thing. The third thing, so far as the uh, so far as the federal systems are concerned, that the, all the states were together and they were taking collective decisions. Uh, so far as this pandemic is concerned, which we have never seen in the past. If the prime minister is announcing that let everybody be lighting a lamp everybody was lighting a lamp, you know, irrespective of, you know, where you stay. So he made very announcements and the people were falling in line. So that is something that the rest of the world can learn from India, that whenever any, any problem arises, whenever any kind of crisis are there, you have to be together. You have to be together to fight with this. Well, on this very happy and positive note, I'm afraid we are out of time now and must bring this wonderful event to a close. It's getting late for some of our participants, so thank you for staying up as well. And apologies to some questions I did not manage to answer, or get answered, sorry. <laughs> Today was the last seminar for 2020, but we will continue in the new year. And our next seminar will take place on the 12th of January. While we will surely be still talking about COVID-19, sadly, for some time to come, our next seminar will be on federalism and intergovernmental relations with Juan Poirier from Canada. So I'm sure that'll be very interesting too, what she has to say. I hope to see all of you or most of you again on the 12th of January and wish you all the best now for the holiday season. Good night or good morning in Latin America and the US. Good afternoon to everyone else. Bye bye.
Ja, sorry. Neither can I. Right. I think we can have a chat. Yeah.